Hello, everybody. Welcome to the session, uh, to this invited talk by Martin Grower. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure to uh, introduce Martin. Martin is a professor at Arvitiha Akad University. Martin has made fundamental contributions to a number of areas, including logic, database theory, algorithms. Most recently, and I suppose that's the focus of this talk today, uh, he has been contributing to machine learning theory by looking at the interface between logic and machine learning by either studying logical properties of uh, machine learning computation structures, such as neural networks, as well as looking at learning of logical artifacts, uh, often using complexity theoretic notions. Uh, without, take, without much further ado, I let Martin take the virtual stage, if you will, and tell us about his latest work on uh, graph neural networks. Okay, hello everybody. It's a, it's a great pleasure to give this talk here. I'd like to thank the organizers, I'd much rather give a live talk, but anyway, we'll do it this way and I'll try to do, do my best to keep you away from your email or whatever you prefer to do this time of the day. Um, okay, so let me get started. I'll just share the screen. And okay, I'll speak about the logic of graph neural networks. So the motivation for this talk is something called neurosymbolic integration, or actually it has many different names. Uh, what, it, what is meant by this is uh, the integration, the combination of traditional logic-based reasoning that we use in AI with the statistical type of reasoning uh, used by machine learning, and when we say neural, maybe in particular deep learning these days. Now, this is a very important goal, I think. It's also extremely difficult. So, so I would fully su subscribe to this goal. I'm, I just don't think we've come very far uh, with it, really. Um, so what I'm trying to do here is maybe somewhat simpler. I'm trying to understand what the interface between logic and neural networks might be. And I think graph neural networks, which I'll talk about, offer a particularly nice interface. And this is basically witnessed by, by two results I want to talk about today. So the talk will have two parts. And the first is I use logic to describe graph neural networks or rather the functions they, they compute. So we characterize the logical expressiveness of graph neural networks. And the second part goes the other way around. Uh, I'm trying to use graph neural networks to express logic. Um, and the this, this second, the first part is, is uh, theory. The second is a bit more practical. Um, what I will talk about there is, is an architecture um, where we can, a very generic architecture for solving uh, constraint satisfaction problems using GNNs. And let's keep it there for the moment. And well, I'll tell you more about this in a while. Okay, so first of all, what are graph neural networks? Um, there's a lot of talk about them and I guess most of you will have seen them, but let me quickly go over them and introduce some notation on the way. So graph neural networks are deep learning architectures for machine learning problems on graphs. Um, and we can view them as a generalization of convolutional neural networks. Uh, for convolutional neural networks, we basically look at a grid structure or just at a line, a one-dimensional uh, structure. Um, whereas for graph neural networks, we don't have this restriction, so we can look at more flexibly structured data. Um, they have a wide range of applications. So uh, my colleagues here at my university in all kinds of fields are quite excited when I mention graph neural networks. And I come to talk to people I, I never dreamt of talking to before. So for example, there are applications in computational biology and chemical engineering, physics, and so on. 
Now, there's a, there's a large variety of GNN architectures by now. Um, and it's, I, I guess it's even hopeless to keep track of all the papers that appear, at least for me it is. Um, the graph neural networks I'll talk about here are, are really the core architecture. They are sometimes called message passing graph neural networks or aggregate combined graph neural networks. Okay, and let me explain how they work. So here we have a graph and we want to do computations on the nodes of the graphs. And basically we graph neural networks just execute a, a message passing protocol, but it's a learned protocol. That's what makes them interesting. So at any time during the computation, each of the nodes has a state and these states evolve over time. So let's say initially at time zero, we initialize all states to the uh, all, all one vector. That's, that's a fairly arbitrary choice I'm making here, but let's stick with that. So states are vectors with real entries, okay? Now they all have their states and well, in this case, the node one sends a message to node four. Okay, it also sends messages to the other nodes. And let's say in this case, the message is just the projection of the state on the first two components. But basically it, it's, it's some, uh, some match message depending on the current state of the nodes. Okay, and node four sends back a message and actually all the nodes send messages to each other. And then what happens is they all update their states. They compute a new state based on the messages they receive. And in the simplest case, the, the functions to compute the messages from the states and also the state update functions are the same for all nodes of the graph, okay? And these functions are computed by, by neural networks, okay? so. They update their states. Now we have states zeta one at all nodes and they send, okay, now we're in this setting. They send messages again. They update their states again. Now we have states zeta two and so on. We may decide to stop at this point or we can do the iteration as long as we want. Okay. Um, so that's the basic principle. And then in the end, we want to derive something useful from the states. Basically get the results of the function that we actually want to compute. So let's, let me describe this a bit more technically. Um, so a GNN, a graph neural network N with D layers maps graphs to sequences of functions defined on the vertex set of the graph and mapping vertices to real vectors. That's the state functions we have at every iteration. And I'm starting at uh, iteration zero with an in initialization. I go on to D iterations. So in the end, I have a function zeta D. Okay, the initialization certainly should encode the node label and other than that, it's just some default value or as we'll discuss later, it's just a random value. Okay. And then, well, all the nodes receive messages and they aggregate the message this in some way. And the interesting part here is that, as I said before, all nodes basically have the same type of message functions. So there is no order between the neighbors. They, all the messages that are coming in look the same from the perspective of node V. So uh, this is a function of the multi-set of messages the node receives. So that's a set where certain entries may appear several times, okay? So typically we, uh, as aggregation, we take symmetric functions like sum or mean or the maximum applied either directly to the states of the neighbors, then we just think uh, the neighbors send their states or to some function of these states. And typically it's enough to take a linear function here. It usually doesn't buy us anything in practice to take more complicated functions, although we could. 
Okay, and there are some theoretical results saying that it's uh, sufficient to use summation as aggregation. So the aggregation function is just the sum of the states of the neighbors. That's good enough, that's completely general. Okay, and then uh, we need a combination function that computes the new state from the old state and the aggregated values of the messages, okay? So that's just some function computed by a feedforward neural network or some more complex neural network architecture. And the parameters of this function of this neural networks are learned. That's the main thing we learn when we, when we train a graph neural network. Possibly it's also these linear functions that have learned parameters. Okay. So these are the functions uh, as I've just described. So um, we update the state, taking the aggregated values of the states of the neighbors, combining them with the old states, and then we get the new state. And now, okay, here I am. Uh, now, now we want some output. So we have two options. We can compute a function that is defined on the nodes of our graph. Sometimes we want that. Um, so we just apply some readout function to the final state of the node. And this is again an, a learned function, maybe, yeah, again, a feed forward neural network that computes this function. And, and the idea here is that to do the computation, of course, we need more information. So the state is typically larger. Uh, than what, what we actually need in the end, okay? Maybe in the end, we just need one truth value. So one bit uh, for the nodes. Okay. And here's a piece of notation. Um, so I usually um, omit these parentheses I have here and write F of GV, so like this. Um, and as I said, this readout function is computed by a feedforward neural network. The second option is that I compute a graph level function. Uh, and for that, I aggregate the states of all nodes and then apply some readout function. And what I can do here is typically um, sum up all the states and then again use some feedforward neural network. Okay, so that's the basic architecture. A very important property this has uh, is that it's isomorphism invariant. And for graph level functions, it just means that um, for all isomorphic graphs, the function values is the same. And if you, uh, if you think about what I said before, all nodes have the same message passing and aggregation functions and combination functions, this is fairly clear that this holds. But it's an important fact if, if I apply, say, just a standard feed forward neural network to the adjacency matrix of a graph, I don't have this invariance property. So that's, that's really an important property of, of graph neural networks because usually I want this invariance. Okay, and for node level functions, this becomes something that is called equivariance. Um, so for all graphs, all isomorphisms between the graphs and all vertices, we have the value at node V in graph G is the same as the value of the image of V under the isomorphism in graph H, okay? So we have these two properties, that's quite nice and, and, and very fundamental. Now, there is one additional thing somehow my uh, browser is always stuck, so whatever. Um, okay, so far I've described GNNs as having a fixed number of iterations and each of the uh, the layers of such a GNN has its own aggregation and combination functions. And we can set it up this way. This is what is sometimes called graph convolutional neural network. But we can also say uh, 
um, we apply the same functions over and over again. And the advantage of doing this is we can do it as long as we want to. Okay, and that's what we would call recurrent GNNs. So we take a single layer and apply it repeatedly. Okay, so we have a single aggregation function and combination function and then update the states in the same way, apply the ag aggregation function to the states of the neighbors, then combine it with the old state. Okay, and we can run this for as long as we want to in particular, we can determine the number of iterations at runtime. For example, depending on the size of the input graph or something more fancy, maybe, uh, maybe the diameter of the input graph to make sure that all the vertices can communicate with one another. Or we can also make it depend on the evolution of the sequence. So we can say, if this sequence of state converges um, then, or if the states get close together, we stop. Although that's something we usually not have. Let me emphasize this. We do not require any convergence. We just decide we stop after D rounds. And it's up to us how to decide this. Okay, so that's the basic setup. Okay, and then, after we have stopped, we apply the readout function to the layer where we have stopped. Or if, if we want, we can also take the average of all layers. As I said, there's millions of variations, but I don't want to go through them. So that's graph neural networks. And in the first part of the talk, I want to talk about the expressiveness of graph neural networks, and in particular, the logical expressiveness. And for this, uh, we digress, we talk about uh, an algorithm for the graph isomorphism problem known as the Weisweiler-Lehmann algorithm. It's a very simple combinatorial algorithm. And what it does is it colors the vertices of a graph. And the goal, when you use this as an isomorphism test at least, is to distinguish vertices that are structurally different. Okay, um, and the way we do this is as follows. Initially, all vertices have the same color. Okay, and then if two vertices have different degrees, then they get different colors. Or in a refinement step, more precisely, when we have two nodes uh, that have different numbers of neighbors in some other color, then these nodes will get different colors now in, in one iteration of the algorithm. And we iterate until the coloring stays stable. And that means the partition induced by the colors is no longer refined. And let me just show you how this works. What I need to do is go here. All right. Okay, so here we, we see just a random graph. And as you also see is that initially all vertices have the same color, blue. And now if we look, for example, this node here has four blue neighbors. This one only has two, so they should get different colors. Whereas these two, this, and this, they should keep the same color because they all have four, both have four blue neighbors. So let's see what happens. Indeed, these two uh, are pink and the neighbors are green. Well, different shades of green, depending on their degrees. But now let's look at these two pink nodes again. Um, so the upper one has two light green neighbors, one darker green neighbor, Whereas the lower one has three of the darker green neighbors. So in the next iteration, they should get different colors. And indeed they do, although the colors are not so easy to distinguish. Okay, and then we go on like this. And at some point, if we, if we continue from here, nothing new happens. So that's the final coloring. So for example, all these little nodes, that's the nodes of degree zero, 
they have one color and the notes of degree one that are neighbors of a node of degree one. So the isolated edges have another color and so on. Okay, that's how the algorithm works. Very simple algorithm, but it somehow detects uh, a lot of structure. It's a quite useful algorithm for isomorphism testing. I'm coming to this. Let me go back to my slides. All right. Um, okay. So this algorithm is often called the weisfeiler liman algorithm, and that's that's fine. Specifically, the one-dimensional weisfeiler liman algorithm, although. There is a subtle difference here, and that is this difference is somewhat relevant in this context. It will not show up in this talk. So everything in this talk for every result, I could say one dimensional weisfeiler liman instead, but you need to be a little bit careful with the exact definitions. So I'll speak about color refinement for that reason. Okay, so. One nice thing about this algorithm is that it's very efficient. It runs almost in linear time, n log n. Um, and there are also no large constants or anything. So it's really efficient in practice. Um, we wondered a while ago if we can get rid of the log factor, if we can do it in linear time. But at least for a fairly large and natural class of algorithms, uh, we showed that you can't do any better, okay? So the algorithm was first introduced in the context of graph isomorphism testing and the way we can use it as an isomorphism test as a standalone isomorphism test is to say, okay, it distinguishes two graphs if their color patterns in the end are different. That means some color appears more often in graph G than in H or the other way around. Okay, if that happens, since the coloring we compute is isomorphism invariant, or maybe I should say equivariant, um, we know that the, if the color patterns are different, the graphs cannot be isomorphic. Well, if the color patterns are the same, um, then we know nothing, so it's an incomplete isomorphism test. And the way color refinement is used in practice uh, of isomorphism testing, it is, an important subroutine of all uh, practical isomorphism tools it is, as I said, as a subroutine. Okay, it's it's like constraint propagation algorithms in in other contexts. Uh, it's very cheap to derive some things, uh, and you do that. Okay, actually, for isomorphism testing, just in this standalone version, it already works on almost all graphs. Okay, that's a result by Baba Erdős and Selko from 1980. On the other hand, it fails on very simple graphs. So look at these two, a cycle of length six versus two triangles. They are obviously not isomorphic, but color refinement does nothing. Initially, all vertices are blue and all have two blue neighbors. So nothing happens if we start the coloring iteration. So this is already the stable coloring and it really tells us nothing. Okay, what, what makes the algorithm extremely interesting is that it has many seemingly completely unrelated characterizations. And I just list them in this theorem without going any deeper, but I, I think that's, that's very interesting. And actually we will add graph neural networks to this list. So, so it seems to be a very fundamental basic mechanism that is uh, somehow described by this simple algorithm. So uh, for all graphs, we have the following equivalence. Color refinement does not distinguish the graphs. The graphs satisfy the same sentences of the logic C2. That's a two variable fragment of first order logic uh, where we add counting quantifiers. There exist at least N elements X satisfying some. Now an algebraic characterization. The graphs are fractionally isomorphic. And this means there's a doubly stochastic matrix X such that 
the adjacency matrix of G times X uh, is equal to X times the adjacency matrix of H. And to explain where this comes from is, uh, well, if we write isomorphism algebraically, we could replace X or say X is a permutation matrix. And if we have this equality, for a permutation matrix, that's a matrix with exactly one, one entry in every uh, row and every column and all other entries zero. Um, then this means the graphs are isomorphic, okay? If this equality is satisfied for a permutation matrix. Now we look at an LP relaxation of this uh, instead of Insisting on integer values, we allow rational values between zero and one, but insist on having row sums and column sums one. Okay, if we satisfy this equality, then we call the graphs fractionally isomorphic, and fractional isomorphism is actually is equivalent to not being distinguishable by color refinement. Uh, I think this is a very nice result by by Tinhofer. And the last result is combinatorial. We count homomorphisms from trees to our graphs. And if for all trees, the number of homomorphisms uh, from this tree to G is the same as the number of homomorphisms from the tree to H, uh, then color refinement does not distinguish them and the other way around, okay? So we have all these nice characterizations. Um, and, and really, if you look at the four points, it's not clear why this should hold, and it's not obvious. All right, um, there's a generalization of, of color refinement uh, to higher dimensions. So now this we call the k-dimensional weisweiler lehmann algorithm. And what it does is it colors k-tuples of nodes in a very similar way as color refinement colors nodes, okay? So the running time of this is now n to the k plus one times log n. And as I said before, the one dimensional version is essentially the same as color refinement, although there's a small difference. Okay, now this k dimensional version is much more powerful than, than color refinement. It's really difficult to find two graphs uh, that are not isomorphic, but cannot be distinguished by, say, three dimensional Weiss Feiler Lima. And it really, um, K dimensional Weiss Feiler Lima somehow is stronger than most of the combinatorial uh, graph isomorphism tests we know. But it's still not a complete isomorphism test. For every K, we can find non isomorphic graphs that cannot be distinguished. Uh, by the k-dimensional Weisfeller-Lehmann algorithm. And actually we don't have to choose the graphs very large. Their size can be linear in k, and we can even uh, choose three regular graphs here, okay? Um, so that's a very important and nice result by Seifura and Immermann. On the other hand, um, on certain graph classes like planar graphs or more generally graphs excluding some fixed graph as a minor or interval graphs, many graph classes. Um, there is a case such that the k-dimensional version is indeed a complete isomorphism test. So for example, for planar graphs, we just need the three-dimensional version. Okay, and then we had all these nice characterizations of color refinement in terms of logic and linear inequalities and homomorphism counts, and we can generalize all these uh, to the k-dimensional version. So for example, for the homomorphism counts, we take graphs of, bound, of, of tree with k instead of trees. Okay, so, so this, this works out very nicely, but we'll only talk about um, the, the one-dimensional version, the color refinement and the following. Okay, so much. So much for Weisfeiler Lehmann, and now let's connect it to, to graph neural networks. Okay, so just a reminder what the graph neural networks were. We have the states at the nodes, 
of a graph. They send messages to their neighbors. And then initially we encode the label of the node in the state. Then we aggregate the messages received from the neighbors. We combine them with the old values. We get the new states. And in the end, we apply a readout function either at the node level. Okay, and uh, if I want to refer to a specific neural net, I put it as an index here or we apply a readout at graph level and we compute a graph, a function defined on graphs. Okay, so that were graph neural networks. And um, here's maybe the main result of this section. It's a, an equivalence between color refinement and distinguishability by graph neural networks. So this basically adds to the theorem I discussed before to all the characterizations um, we have for color refinement. Here's another one. For all graphs, color refinement does not dis uh, or distinguishes G and H. Now I've written it with distinguishing and instead of not distinguishing doesn't matter. Um, if and only if uh, there is a graph neural network that distinguishes the graphs, okay? So there is a neural network such that uh, it, we have different values um, for the graph level functions here. And actually we can, we can get the values as far apart as we want. So um, it's, it's, it's not a matter of, uh, of just numeric stability. Now this result has been proved independently in these two papers. Um, the, the results are slightly different. The, uh, the results by, by these guys, the proof is somewhat simpler. It uses universal approximation results for feed forward neural networks. Um, and the applicability is a bit wider because um, this basically works for essentially all activation functions in the neural networks. However, um, the neural networks they construct can get exponentially large in the graphs um, that we look at, whereas in our results, which is a little more restricted in terms of activation function, we guarantee that we, we get polynomially large uh, neural networks to distinguish the graphs. But that's just a side remark. Um, now let's apply this or extend this to a logical context. So we have this equivalence between um, the color refinement algorithm and this logic C2, this two variable counting first order logic. Now what Barcelo et al proved is that if we have a property of graphs an isomorphism invariant property of graphs that ex is expressible in this logic then there is a GNN that computes, it should be P, this property, okay? Um, so, or decides this property, actually, I should say. So all properties that can be specified in this logic can be decided by graph neural networks. Okay, now, a non-uniform version of this result follows from the previous theorem. So if we focus on properties of graphs of size n, then this follows from the previous result. But this result here is uniform. It applies to, um, to all graph sizes. There's one graph neural network that works uh, for all sizes of graphs, okay? They also prove a variant of this theorem for node properties. I don't want to go into this. It, it gets a bit more technical. And this is actually where the difference between one dimensional Weisfeiler Lehmann and color refinement plays a role. And they also prove a partial converse of the theorem. So if we have a property that is decidable by a graph neural networks, and is at the same time expressible in first order logic, then it's also expressible in this logic C2, which is a small fragment of first order logic. Okay. Um, 
In general, a converse does not hold. So we need this additional condition that the property is expressible in first order logic. Okay, now we can generalize everything uh, to higher dimensional Weisfeller Lehmann algorithms. So in this paper, we introduced a model of higher order graph neural networks. They pass messages between tuples of vertices. And we basically then can show that these higher order graph neural networks uh, corresponds to the uh, higher dimensional Weisfeller Lehmann algorithm. Okay. So we can also translate this to logic order K, G and N's have the same expressiveness as the logic CK plus one. Well, this is a bit sloppily said, but basically we can extend the results through all dimensions. Actually the, the higher dimensional versions of the neural networks do have some applications just because they can detect more properties and sometimes this is useful. Anyway, now I want to go to a different direction. Higher order graph neural networks are very nice in a theoretical sense because we have this correspondence to this natural hierarchy uh, of properties in logic or combinatorics or also algebraic properties. But then in practice, I mean, these things get large. If we want to, we may be able to, to set up a, a network on the, on the pairs of nodes, but if we really want to use five tuples, that's prohibitive. We, we basically have number of nodes to the fifth many nodes in our, uh, in our message passing network and we won't get anywhere with this. Um, there's an alternative way of strengthening graph neural networks. And that's a way that is easy to use in practice and has been shown um, to, to be quite successful and extend the power. And that's random node initialization. So suppose we initialize the states of all nodes of a graph neural networks randomly. Say just taking a standard normal distribution for uh, for, for all the states, well, either for all entries in the state vectors or it's enough to just use the first uh, entry, just add some randomness. The distribution also doesn't really matter, okay? Um, then, okay, the first thing we somehow somehow lose something. The, the computation is no longer deterministic. Um, and the result in some sense is no longer invariant because it also depends on this randomness. On the other hand, if we say now what this neural network computes is a random variable and that's the right way to look at it, uh, then this random variable is of course invariant or equivariant if we're interested in node level functions, okay? Um, so this has still nice properties. We just have to, uh, to deal with the randomness and, and, and a way to deal with it is, is by repeating, by doing several runs with different node initialization. And then usually um, we, we get good concentration results. So this is quite useful and it has been observed in practice uh, and also demonstrated by specific experiments that uh, GNNs with random node initialization can be substantially more expressive than GNNs with constant initialization, okay? So, um, so in the second paper, the, We've done experiments where we clearly look at properties we know that cannot be expressed by color refinement and hence by uh, neural networks with constant initialization. And uh, they can easily be done with random node initialization. And also in this paper by Sato et al, it was shown that many interesting combinatorial properties can be expressed and when we add uh, random node initialization. And then what we showed is that actually we can express all invariant functions on graphs. Okay. 
And again, we also have a node level version of this result. Um, there's, there's one caveat uh, with this result. It's a, it's a non-uniform result. And what, what this means is that for each size of the input graph, we need a separate GNN here, okay? Um, all, universal approximation results of this type also for feed forward neural networks always have this property, this non-uniformity, which is a bit unfortunate, uh, but we, we don't know how to get around it. For example, the result, the logical expressiveness result by Barcelo et al doesn't have the non-uniformity. That's a uniform result. But um, it only works because we look at properties expressible in first order logic. So we only need a, a constant number of iterations iter intuitively. Okay, so here we only have the non-uniform result. Okay, and that completes the first part of the talk. Now the second part is, is much shorter and I want to turn this around. I want to apply graph neural networks to a logical formalism. And I take a very simple formalism that of constraint satisfaction problems or problems that can be specified by um, primitive positive formulas, existential formulas with just conjunction. But it's a start and it works out very nicely. And I think graph neural networks are very well suited uh, for an integration with logic because of their flexibility and because of this view of the, of the neural networks as doing kind of distributed computations, local computations, which is in some sense similar to what we can do in a logic like, like first order logic. Okay, so what are constraint satisfaction problems? I'm sure you, you have all seen them, but let me just go over this very quickly. So constraint satisfaction problems provide a general framework for specifying combinatorial search problems. We want to assign values to variables subject to constraints. Um, now, specific CSPs are, are given by their constraint language. And the constraint language just tells us which types of constraints are allowed. And some constraint languages are easy in the sense that we can solve um, the, the correspondent problems efficiently. For example, if all the constraints are linear equations, we just have to solve a system of linear equations that we can do easily. If the constraints are uh, disjunctions of Boolean variables, then we have to solve a Boolean satisfiability problem, which is hard, okay? So it depends on the constraint language and by result due to Bulatov and Juk, there's actually a dichotomy. Either it's NP hard or it's in polynomial time. Okay, what we will actually look at is a, a soft constraint satisfaction problem or a maximization version of this where the objective is to satisfy as many constraints as possible. And with this, we can describe many combinatorial optimization problems. Okay, and that's, that's what we look into. And in our initial work, the work that is published already, we focused on binary constraints over a finite domain. Now, finite domain is somewhat important for, for what we do. Binary constraints, is at least in principle not terribly important because um, we can translate all CSPs into CSPs with binary constraints. Um, now for the practical applicability, of course, it does play a role. And I'll come back to this restriction later. Okay, so um, let me just describe how we describe the the, the constraint satisfaction problems or their instances as graphs so that we can apply um, graph neural networks. So think of uh, the, the binary constraints over some domain D and remember we take a finite domain just as a Boolean D by D matrix where the entrance for two values tells us just if 
these values for, are, are allowed for the two variables in a constraint. I'll show you an example in a minute. Okay, and then we can describe a binary constraint as a directed graph. The edges correspond to the constraints, the nodes correspond to the variables. Okay, and this can look like this. So here we look at two satisfiability or in our situation, maybe maximum two satisfiability. So the constraints are disjunctions of two Boolean variables. And then, well, we want to satisfy all constraints or as many as possible. So we have this conjunction. So we have a formula in two CNF like this. We have three variables here. For example, this first constraint corresponds to the red edge. And this constraint is satisfied if uh, both, well, Let's, let's look at the zero entry, that's easier. If both variables get value zero, it's not satisfied, otherwise it is satisfied. Okay, and similarly for the other constraints, so here we have the second one, the green edge. So this is not satisfied if x1 is true, is true and x3 is false, so this is this entry, and so on, okay? And so here we have a graph with different types of edges, but only finitely many types of edges um, because we only have finitely many possible D by D matrices in the end, if we have a finite domain. And for each of these edges, our, our neural networks will have a different message passing function. Okay, so that we can, uh, we can take into account different types of constraints. Okay, other examples are two colorability or maximum two colorability, maximum cuts. These are all binary constraint satisfaction problems that we can describe in this way. And we'll come and look at an example for maximum two colorability uh, in a few minutes. Okay, so here's our, our architecture. So basically it's a it's a graph neural network architecture applied to this constraint graph. I, I just described then the readout function in the end will give us values for all the variables, for all the nodes of the network. Okay, now one thing we do for the updates of the states, we use a more complicated neural network architecture than just feed forward neural networks. We use LSTM cells there with the idea that we somehow want to well remember the, the evolution of this sequence of states a bit better and, uh, and take this into account during the computation. Okay, so we have this GNN architecture that we apply to, uh, to the max CSPs. Um, now, what is nice about this is it's applicable to all binary CSPs. And what we can do is basically we compile the constraint language into the loss function. So the logic that is there, which is represented by the constraint language um, is directly translated to the neural network architecture. In this case, just the loss function, okay? And I'll tell you uh, on the next slide how we do that. So that's a crucial step. It's, it's fairly straightforward, but anyway, it's, it's crucial in this whole thing. Um, what is also nice is the training is unsupervised. Essentially, we can train this such neural networks by just generating random instances of the CSPs, and we don't need to solve them. What the network tries to achieve is to satisfy as many constraints as it can. Of course, we never know uh, if the instance is unsatisfiability. In this sense, we only look at the maximization problem. We have no guaranteed guarantees whatsoever, um, but uh, experimentally, we can show that it works reasonably well. Um, what it also does is the training examples can be fairly small, say a couple of hundred nodes. Um, and we can still do inference on much larger examples 
several thousands of nodes. So that scales fairly well. And that's, that's a nice feature of this, this architecture. We just have to learn the different state update functions and message functions. And then we can apply them to graphs of any size. Okay, so this is all nice. Uh, we have a lot of experimental results. I, I decided not to bore you with tables and charts. Uh, you can look at our paper if you want to. Um, so very briefly, what we find is that this tends to work better, better than other GNN-based CSP solvers, at least at the time when we did the experiments. It also works better than other generic solvers like greedy or semi-definite programming, things like that. Um, it's by and large competitive with specialized solvers for specific problems. Um, sometimes, and this happened in particular in the case of maximum two satisfiability, uh, the results we get with this architecture are even better uh, than specialized solvers for this, okay? And another advantage is that this is very efficient. Once we have trained our neural networks, just doing the inference is really fast, where, where the solvers often take, um, take hours. Uh, our inference is, just takes a few seconds. So that's, that can be really nice, even if the results are sometimes not as good, okay? So, um, so I'm, I'm not saying we can solve NP hard problems suddenly. Um, what I would say from a practical perspective is that we, we add a method that we can use in a portfolio. And in a way, um, we, can, we can hope that the training procedure of these new networks and the new, the, the networks are then able to detect certain structures, certain patterns in the, uh, in the instances that we don't see and therefore can solve certain things that maybe other methods cannot so easily. Um, and another nice aspect is that it's completely generic. We can apply it to any problem. So if we have a CSP where we don't have a specialized solver, we can still um, apply this very easily, okay? Okay, so how do we compute the loss functions? Let me, let me basically um, tell you our reasoning for this. So let's say we have an instance with variables X, constraint C, domain D, okay? And then our readout function is a soft, or gives us a soft assignment for every node or every variable, um, a D-dimensional vector and the way we interpret these numbers, well, they are just numbers between zero and one, of course, but imagine for a moment that these are probabilities indicating, um, indicating the probability that a particular value is taken. So we make sure uh, by using a softmax uh, activation on this readout that indeed uh, this gives us a probability distribution if the meanings are, is to have really probabilities, doesn't matter. Uh, that's just uh, what explains our derivation, okay? And so now imagine we draw values for, e, for all the uh, variables um, by using this probability. So the, the value is one specific uh, of the D possible values, um, well, by just drawing from, from the distribution, okay? I think I've written this here really terribly. Anyway, um, so then the probability that we satisfy a constraint is this sum. Uh, it's basically um, the sum over all possible value pairs of the probabilities uh, all possible value pairs in the relation of the probabilities we get. So we want to maximize this probability. It's convenient to take to take logar oh, shoot to take logarithms. 
So, well, we can maximize the uh, logarithm or since it's a loss function, we minimize minus log and then we sum over all constraints and normalize. Okay, that's essentially what we do. We add some additional normalization factors, but that's essentially our loss function. Okay, it has some plausibility uh, to it coming from these, these observations. Um, but I mean, the nice thing is that it really, it depends on this relation in the constraints, okay? Um, so we can automatically generate this function if we know the constraint language. We know then all pairs, all constraints appearing, all, all pairs that are in there, and we can, we can write this expression, okay? And then we can, we can train the network and get a solver and apply it. All right. We also have a generalization to, to higher arities I mentioned before. Of course, we can translate all CSPs to binaries, CSP. So in principle, our binary uh, thing is good enough, although we don't have to do this. We can also directly translate other constrained languages to, to more suitable GNN topo topologies. And this is what we actually do and we get much better results. And the nice thing here is for, for this higher arity case, we not only translate the constraint language to the loss function, but also to the graph topology. So uh, here we are in a situation that both the graph where we, are, where we set up the, the, the GNN and the loss function uh, depend on the constraint language. So, so the logic of the problem really goes into the uh, neural network architecture, okay? So this is work in progress with my student Jan Turnsoff. And the results we have so far also for higher RAT problems like MaxSat satisfiability for arbitrary uh, CNF formulas are quite pro promising. Um, uh, but, but as I said, it's work in progress. And the last thing I want to do, I want, want to show you one example. Um, which I find quite cute because um, it shows a little bit how these uh, GNN based solvers work. So the problem we look at is two colorability. Okay, and we just want to color the nodes of a grid. And we want to color them in such a way that uh, the endpoints of all edges have different colors. So it's a proper two coloring um, and so the colors are gray and black. And here you see all the red edges are conflicts where we violate a constraint at the moment. Okay, so that's, that's our initial setting. And now we start uh, the graph neural networks and see how the, the assignment to the variables we get evolves uh, over time. And what we see there is, let's pause for a minute, that there is some global coordination, which is quite mysterious. And the strategy uh, the neural network follows um, for solving this is quite reasonable. It pushes the conflicts to the edges and there they disappear. Um, so you see this very nicely. And um, well, we haven't programmed anything there. It's just a generic neural network architecture. But still there's this global coordination and this global strategy, uh, which evolves quite quickly. So, so I find this uh, quite fascinating. I wish I understood it better. Anyway, that's what happens. So I think it's also so quite nice from just the perspective to try to understand what the mechanisms are, what these neural networks actually do. Uh, but I have to admit, we haven't come very far on that. All right, that's pretty much what I have to say. Just a few concluding remarks. So uh, the GNNs are a very flexible learning architecture. And I believe that's what allows us to adapt them to, to logical formalism such as CSPs as we did here. 
Okay. Um, then the first part of the talk shows that we have a good understanding of the expressiveness of such graph neural networks, although there are quite a few interesting theoretical questions that remain, remain open, in particular when it comes to uniformity. So that's expressiveness results across input sizes. So for example, here is one question. Can we express all graph queries computable in polynomial time by a recurrent graph neural network? Okay, related to the question if we can express uh, say all, uh, all polynomial time queries with, with data log or, or something like this. I heard this in an earlier talk today. So that's the neural network version of this. Okay, and then of course, I should also say that expressiveness results only tell us half the story because they completely ignore learning. And we just say there is some setting to the, the parameters of the neural network that gives us this function uh, without saying how we find this setting. On the other hand, um, most of the results we present here, the expressive this results also have good experimental support, by which I mean that usually we can actually find, find the parameter settings just using the generic uh, gradient descent optimization algorithms. Okay, and that's it. Thank you for listening.